Good morning. Good morning. Hopefully everybody got a good night's sleep last night and uh, you're just raring to go this morning. Uh, hopefully uh, your eyes are wide open. If not, there is coffee out there in the foyer area and you can help yourself at any point during our uh, time together this morning. Uh, again, uh, it's exciting to be able to have a spring Bible conference. I'm excited that uh, Dr. Mark Farnham is able to be with us and it, it's just a real blessing. Last night was, was just worth it, wasn't it? I mean, it was just tremendous. Just that first session alone, I thought, boy, this is really worth it. And uh, I really appreciated everything that was said. It was a very quick two hours last night, and I'm anticipating it'll be a, a speedy three hours here this morning as well. We will take breaks. Uh, so there was kind of three sessions through the morning. So Mark will be stopping after each session and we'll take a break there'll be refreshments out there in the foyer you can help yourself use restrooms whatever and we'll come back in uh, some have asked about the special offering that i mentioned last night and so our offering boxes are in the back as you know they're hanging on the wall there up above them uh, there's a rack and it has uh, envelopes in it these are your regular envelopes for regular giving and this is an offering, special offering envelope, and this is going to go as a love offering for Mark. And so if you want to just keep that uh, in your mind, um, you can utilize that anytime through tomorrow morning. All right. So it's exciting, uh, as I mentioned, and Mark mentioned last night that we go way back. And he said it was the funniest thing, Mark, you said last night. I'm one of those weird kids who knew that I was going to go into the ministry at the age of 12. And I'm thinking they're going, huh, I must be one of those weird kids too. Because I was 12 years old at Camp Northfield in Western. Now, if you say you were at Camp Northfield when this happened, I, we're going to. No way. Ah, oh, were there missionaries there? Because <laughs> I, I was called in ministry at the age of 12 uh, as well. Camp Northfield, uh, missionary couple, uh, and they were presenting to us little kids. And uh, I remember the same thing. And it is, it is interesting to know what God basically wants to do with your life at the young, young age. So we're both one of those weird kids. <laughs> I didn't know we had that in common. Isn't that great? Well, let's have a word of prayer. I'll turn it over to Mark here this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for bringing us together. We're thankful, Father, for Mark's uh, knowledge and for his love for you and his love for sharing Christ with others. Uh, Lord, may each one of us uh, be emboldened in our faith and confident to share. Help us, Father, to have opportunities, I pray, as well. And help us, Lord, as we uh, come in contact with the opportunities uh, to just be able to, to show the love of Christ as we ask questions and uh, seek to introduce people to Jesus Christ. So help us, Father, today to um, be alert and to uh, be able to, to stow the information in our hearts and be willing to utilize the information in our daily living that we might bring you glory in all these things. In Christ's name, amen. All right, thank you so much for coming back today. It's going to be a gorgeous day, and I said to Kevin this morning, you are really wise to get this over with by noon today because sometimes when I do conferences and the weather is nice outside, people will come and they're always like looking out the window like, oh, come on. So we will be done by noon. The goal this morning is to, for about 30 to 35 minutes in each session, for me to, to teach, and then we'll take Q&A, and then we'll break for about 10 minutes and we'll try to start at the next session at 10 and then the final session at 11 to stay on schedule. Uh, but be thinking of questions. Uh, hopefully overnight you've been spurred to think of some things. So let's jump right in then and talk about pulling down strongholds. This is the session, as I said, the, the magic pixie dust where uh, the rubber meets the road. Like we're going to talk about what does a real conversation with an unbeliever look like uh, based on what we learned already, that it's our job to prepare ourselves to give answers when people raise objections to the Christian faith, and then understanding unbelievers that every person has a knowledge of God implanted in them, in them, and they are suppressing the truth in a thousand different ways, how then do we engage them in conversation in an effective way? And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul gives us a wonderful metaphor 
pulling down strongholds, which helps us to think of our role in engaging unbelievers. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 3, Paul is contrasting um, physical warfare with spiritual warfare. He says, we, we don't have a physical warfare to fight. In our modern day terms, we, we don't have a jihad to take up as Christians. We don't take up physical arms for the sake of the faith. Uh, but rather, as Paul says, we have a spiritual battle, and it is a spiritual battle. Well, if you wonder, you know, why am I so afraid to witness the people? Well, part of it is because you may feel unequipped, but the other part is it is a spiritual battle. You are trying to undo the work of the evil one who has blinded the minds of unbelievers and show them the light of the glory of the knowledge of the gospel of Christ. And Satan doesn't want that to happen. So he's going to put in you fear, put in you a sense of inadequacy, put in you this sense of uh, what if this person uh, makes fun of me or what if they throw a punch? I mean, you know, think of all the things that go through our minds of why we don't uh, become bolder. And that's where Paul says this is a spiritual battle and we need to take up spiritual weapons. So 2 Corinthians 10, 3, for though we walk in the flesh, here's a positive use of the term flesh in the New Testament. That is, we're, we're physical beings. We are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So the metaphor here is that as I'm gauging an unbeliever, their system of unbelief, remember we finished last night talking about worldview, that every unbeliever has built up a view of the world which explains all the important questions to them. Who am I? Why am I here? What's wrong with the world? Where am I going? Things like that. that. That is their worldview, and we could picture it as a fortress, or as Paul says, a stronghold. In the ancient world, uh, they, when they would protect cities, they'd build walls around the cities. But then inside usually was a stronghold, which was you know, double or triple thick stone. It was a tower. Uh, it was filled with supplies. So if the walls were breached, they could flee into the stronghold and wait for help to arrive. As we think of this, every unbeliever, as they, as they suppress the knowledge of God, build up some kind of a stronghold of unbelief. And our goal then is to figure out in, in asking them questions and discussing them and engaging with them is what is the stronghold of this person? A good metaphor of, for what we're trying to do is to pull the rug out from under their feet. In other words, some approaches to apologetics say, you know, when they offer a, an objection, come back with answers. You know, how do we know God exists? Well, don't you know the cosmological, teleological, anthropological, all these philosophical arguments? And we're, we're supposed to butt heads with unbelievers. Um, and if they, they raise another objection, we come back with more evidence. This is a, an approach called evidentialism. And there's value in it, but the burden of that approach is you've got to learn so much before you would ever feel adequate to engage unbelievers. As we're going to see today, I don't think we have to do that. It helps to know a little bit about certain religions or, or worldviews, but I'm going to ask questions about what this person believes. I learned this when I was a pastor uh, in Connecticut years ago, and uh, I did funerals for people without religious affiliation, and the funeral home director was a good Italian Catholic. His name's John. He became a friend of mine. And so one day I was trying to witness to him, and he kept saying, Mark, in, you know, I'm Catholic, but I don't believe this, 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 this. He started naming all these things that he didn't believe. And I realized I never took the time to ask him what he believed. I just assumed he accepted all of it. And that's where we have to be careful. What we want to do then, rather, is when people raise objections, to, to, to focus on their objection, not answer it right away. So when someone says something like, how can there be a good, all-powerful, loving God when there's so much evil and the suffering in the world. My first question is, what do you mean by evil? In other words, I'm not trying to provide an answer. I want to deconstruct their objection to show that they have all these assumptions, unproven assumptions in their objection that they must defend and support before I could ever provide an answer for it. Another metaphor would be disarming unbelievers. I have a friend who does judo, and judo is one of those martial arts where you use your opponent's motion against them. So if they come at you and swing, instead of blocking, you actually pull them 
toward you and throw them off balance. So what I think we're going to learn today is that way to, when people throw objections and come at us, we actually pull them toward us. But tell me more about, you know, your, what you believe, or, or why do you think that, as we'll see in just a moment. It's much less confrontational. So here's what I want to do. First of all, in this passage, Paul talks about challenging the authority of the non-Christian's belief system. That is, every system of unbelief, every unbeliever has an authority that they look to. We'll, we'll look at some of the authorities that people rely on in just a moment. But everyone bases their arguments on something. My own experience, something my college professor told me, my parents, my priests, this philosopher, this scientist, you know, the Kardashians, wh whatever. <laughs> everyone puts their trust in something or someone, and some of them are really inadequate, such as celebrities and, you know, cartoons, whatever. I mean, people, I've met people that their whole philosophy of life is based on Japanese anime cartoons. I'm like, wow, that's really interesting that you base your life on cartoons. But people do. So what, what is he talking about here? Paul is talking about destroying a stronghold. And what that means is to reveal the weakness, reveal the weakness of the authority that the unbeliever trusts in. In other words, as I'm asking them what they believe and why they believe it, what I'm trying to do is show them that that authority that they're relying ultimately fails when it's examined. It fails to provide adequate answers. It fails to help in time of um, real-life need and situation. A lot of people in their belief system want to keep it all philosophical up here. But one of the tests, as we'll see in just a moment, is how do you live this out? For example, people say, well, we, we can't know anything for certain. Really? So when you go out to the parking lot and you look for your car, you don't assume that you know which car is yours, so you try every car because you don't know for certain anything. When you go home, you got to look up your address, and then you got to doubt, well, was that entered correctly? No, you can't actually live that way thinking that we can't know anything. And so we want to always test beliefs on that level. So here's the key is we want to ask questions that force the person to reveal the foundations of their beliefs. In other words, many people live with unexamined assumptions, and we want to get to the heart of that and ask questions that force them to defend why they believe what they believe. Now, these, these questions I'm going to give you, you notice know, so there's a, a number of little dots there. Uh, these have taken years of research. Um, it's not light stuff. It's heavy stuff. So uh, And these are uh, trademarks, so when you use them, please verbally give credit. No, it's... They're so basic, you're thinking, why are, we, why are we paying this guy to come here? And some of you are saying, we're paying this guy to come here? Um, these are just simple questions. And my hope is when we move through these questions, you'll walk away saying, I could do that. I, I, I could do that. That's so easy. And that's the key. Is My goal this weekend is for every one of you in the next week or two, next few weeks, to begin to put this into practice in your conversations with unbelievers. If you walk away saying, oh, that was really interesting, and you never share the gospel, and you never uh, uh, seek to start conversations with unbelievers, then I have completely failed. Because the goal is to move every one of us into our contacts with unbelievers in the world to begin to ask questions like these. So first one is this. What do you mean by that? I know, profound, right? And basically, these are the questions I work through, not in any particular order, but depending on the conversation, whenever I encounter an unbeliever. When they say things like, well, I just, I can never be a Christian. I can never check my door at the brain. Uh, check my, you see, yeah. <laughs> check my brain at the door. I'm doing it already. Our initial reaction is to be defensive. And we, folks, we can never be defensive. Remember, you're dealing with someone who knows the truth and is trying to suppress it, and every day God's revealing the truth to them. So we have no need to be defensive. We know what the truth is because it's found in a person in Jesus Christ. And therefore, when people say insulting things like that, especially when you read 1 Peter, over and over again, Peter says, don't, don't be bothered by people's insults. They're not insulting you. They're insulting Christ. So when someone says something like that, I can never check my brain at the door, I'm not going to give any answer. I'm just going to say something like, well, what do you mean by that? Because as a Christian, I don't feel like I check my brain at the door because there's actually a lot to learn and there's historical facts 
that, uh, the, that the scriptures are based on. So what do you mean by check your brain at the door? And, and asking that type of question does one of two things. Number one, it could reveal that they, that's just their pat answer and uh, it's just a cop-out answer. And when you push them on that, they're like, uh, well, I don't know, someone, someone told me that before. Well, that's not a very rational thing to believe, is it? Or they might say, well, because I visited this church and these people were insane. I mean, just say and do all, doing all kinds of crazy things. In that case, I could answer back, well, I, I don't know what that church is like or I don't know what you heard, but can I share with you what the real message of Christianity is? And just by asking a question, you're learning more about what their objections are. Here's another one. Why do you believe that? And what you'll notice after a little while is these are all just variations on a theme. Why do you believe that? Well, I, I'm an atheist. Oh, interesting. Why, are you, why don't you believe in God? Our tendency is like, oh, atheist. Scary. And we'll talk about that later this morning, about how do we encounter atheists and skeptics. They're actually the easiest, I think, to deal with, the funnest, because they are trying to deny the most obvious thing in the world that God says, you know, I exist, and here's some things about me. Uh, we're, we tend to be very intimidated and we have to be careful not to do that so ask questions why do you believe that or i'm a muslim why do you why are you a muslim i'm catholic why are you catholic well i, I don't know i just i just am i grew up that way okay so but i mean do, do you why do you believe it to be true that that invites response it invites reflection on the part of that person that they haven't really well that's a good question i don't know I haven't really thought about it and that opens the door then to begin to challenge here's another one how do you know that Well, you know, the Bible is uh, it's just an old book. Why, you know, why do you believe that? Well, how do, you, how do you know it's just an old book? Tell me about what you know about the Bible. And again, so they're throwing challenges at you. You're asking questions that are drawing them into to give more explanation. Here's another one. What do you base that on? Well, don't you know that uh, you know, Christians are the most violent people in the world? Like, what, what do you base that on? And again, what we'll see in just a moment is a lot of people bluff in their answers. They make up facts and figures. I mentioned yesterday the, uh, the co-founder of the Pennsylvania Skeptics Conference who lives in Lancaster, where I live. Uh, this week, he'll be in my apologetics class. After I teach apologetics to my students at the end of the semester, he comes in and pre he presents his best case for atheism. And he and the students go back and forth. And uh, he says all kinds of things that are factually total nonsense. And I, I prepare the students ahead of time. So don't accept anything he says. Challenge it, because a lot of what he says, is he's just making things up off the top of his head. A good example was last time he was in, he was challenging my students, saying, how can you believe the exodus happened? Don't you know that if there were two or three million Jews leaving Egypt by the time the first ones got to the end of the promised land, that the last ones wouldn't even have crossed the Red Sea? You know, don't you know that, you know, that space is only the size of Rhode Island? I'm like... Time out. Uh, Rhode Island has 800,000 people, and it looks like it's an empty state when you drive through it, right? There's like nobody around. There's like one city, and then just some swamp Yankees is what they call them. Um, so Rhode Island could hold millions and millions of people and still not be full. But secondly, that area is much bigger than that. In other words, he was, he was citing things that were simply factually false. And that's why we have to push back a little bit with a challenge. Here's another one. How have you come to that conclusion? Well, I just think all religions are the same. Interesting. How have you come to that conclusion? Have you studied world religions? Well, no, I just what I know of it, and, you know. Well, shouldn't you know more about something before you come to such sweeping conclusions? Especially that one. Because when people say all religions are the same, they're basically saying, I have ascended the summit of human knowledge and experience and have looked down on all these different religious people who don't know that they all believe the same thing, but I have attained knowledge that stands over them. I mean, think of the arrogance in that kind of statement. And it's simply not true. The differences between the world religions are massive on the most important things. Here's another one. Where did you get that idea? And you probably run out of circles after this. I have a few more. But as you can see, these are all variations on a theme. And the problem with some apologetics approaches is they give you a formula. Uh, I think about the way of the master with Kirk Cameron and uh, Ray Comfort. 
there's some good in that. Not a fan of the God's Not Dead movies at all. It pr presents this very fake portrait of unbelievers. Basically gives the message, if you want to see an atheist saved, run them over with your car, and while they're dying, you can lead them to Christ. Uh, but the way the master approach is very formulaic. Have you ever broken the law? Have you ever stolen? Have you ever done this or that? Then you're a lawbreaker. Here's what God says. And you encounter every person the same way. And it's essentially a gospel burp monologue, as opposed to asking questions and finding out where people are, and then responding based on the things that they say with a question like this. So it's not like, okay, I, I got to ask these questions in a row. No, just have a normal conversation with people and push back when they raise objections. Here's some more variations. Who said that? Well, don't you know that the world's brightest scientists have said, well, who are those people? And, and where did they say this? And uh, is there, so we should just accept everything they say? Is that source reliable? Well, you know, I read on a blog somewhere, okay. Uncle Billy Bob's Mountain Goat Farm blog on world affairs, you know, things. Is, is that a reliable source for truth? Can you give me an example of that? When people say, well, there's all kinds of errors in the Bible. <laughs> Can you give me an example of that? And I've had people say, well, I don't know. I'm not a Bible scholar. Okay, you just said there's errors. And when I asked you for one example, you couldn't name one. That, that's not a very rational thing to do is object to the Bible based on errors if you can't even name one. Or if they do, they'll name one and then you explain to them that's really not an error at all. You're misunderstanding. I was on a plane one time from North Carolina to Philadelphia and sat down next to this guy, and he was a lot of fun. He had been in the military, did something with pharmaceuticals, just very funny, outgoing guy. We talked the whole time. And I began to ask him about his faith and begin to tell him about Christ. And he's like, oh, you know, uh, this, is, this is great because, you know, I really admire Jesus. He was, a, he was a good guy, you know, and other than that one time he sinned, he really lived an exemplary life. I said, come again? He said, you know, that one time Jesus sinned. I said, no, I'm pretty sure he didn't. He said, really? I, I, I thought for sure he did. I said, well, when, what do you think he did to sin? He's like, uh, well, that, that time he turned water into wine, didn't he, like, snap at his mother or something like that? I said, well, he did tell Mary it was not his time to reveal his power, and he did it in rather firm way, but he, he didn't, like, lose his temper. He's like, oh. I'm really glad you cleared that up for me. <laughs> and, and then, very strangely, this is a whole different point, but uh, suddenly the conversation turned like that, and he had been telling me what he did in Iraq. He was an inf infantry man that often guarded outposts of larger bases, and he said, you know, we did some really bad things in Iraq. And I thought, oh boy, I didn't say anything. He's like, you know, I was on guard duty, and we had orders to, to shoot men at 100 yards if they would not stop coming toward the base after repeated warnings, because he said we had suicide bombers in the area. And then he said we had orders to shoot women at 75 yards. And you know what comes next? And he said, how could God ever forgive me for what I did over there? And it opened up the door beautifully to talk about forgiveness and redemption. And I imagine when he got on that plane, he didn't intend to tell the person sitting next to him that he, about that. But because I was able to help him clarify some misunderstandings about the Bible and show concern for him, suddenly he opened up. And uh, so, so pushing back by asking questions like this, is, it keeps the conversation going. Notice, unbelievers typically rely on the following authorities. These are some of the most popular things that people believe. Some would say, well, science. I trust science. And science is a wonderful gift from God to know our world, but it can't provide all the answers. And people who typically rely on science believe that only what can be observed is fact, which is not true. Too many scientists have made claims like this, like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, the well-known atheist scientists know nothing about philosophy and the atheistic philosophers are going no no don't say that that's not true because when they say the only way we can know anything is through science they're eliminating so much of human experience things like memory things like the laws of logic all different kinds of things that you don't find scientifically but some people believe that science gives us the answer for everything 
and they claim that religion is faith, not knowledge, which again is also not true. If you're a scientist doing your work, you have to trust that your perceptions are correct in what you're observing. You have to trust and have faith in the scientific process. In other words, science is never purely a materialistic, physical endeavor. It includes all kinds of philosophical assumptions. A few years ago in England, uh, an atheist group started an advertising campaign, and this was one of their ads on the side of the double-decker buses in London. There's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. What's, the, what's a word that stands out to you as uh, rather arrogant? Probably, right? Like, okay, that's, you know, what percentage am I shooting at here? But there's another problematic word in this. It's the word enjoy. Is that all life is, is just enjoyment? What about uh, when there's grief, when there's sorrow, when there's loss? What does the lack of God mean for that? And uh, it, it showed a real blind spot in the eyes of the uh, materialist scientific community in England. This is an interesting quote from Catherine Hepburn. I'm an atheist and that's it. I believe there's nothing we can know except that we should be kind to each other and do what we can for other people. What are some questions you would want to ask Catherine Hepburn or someone who would make a statement like this? In other words, how would you push back on the statement? Why be kind? Why be kind? If there is no God, and I get this argument a lot from atheists, well, you know, we have found that empathy and kindness works. It builds a better society. Well, that's one way. But aggression and cruelty will get you pretty far, too. So I would be, if I'm an atheist, I would be really happy if most of the people in the world went for kindness and empathy because that's going to make my job a whole lot easier. Aggression and cruelty on empathetic people is really simple. But there's no compelling reason if there's not a God to be good. If we're just all the... The combination of our DNA, as materialists want to tell us, that, that you are nothing more than the DNA of your body and, and your cells, and you just do what you've been programmed to do, there is no compelling reason to do good over evil. You're supposed to survive, and you survive any way you can. And if you hit the genetic jackpot, and you happen to be really strong, you're the winner. And the weak and sickly, they're the losers. And yet, no one wants to live in a world that way, do they? But notice another thing, I believe that there's nothing we can know except that we should be kind. <laughs> so we can't know anything except this truth. Okay, how do you know that truth? And do you realize you're claiming an absolute truth when you're just saying that? I mean, this is so contradictory, but it appeals to those who don't want there to be a God in their lives. I just turned that off. There we go. Here's another one. You could be good without God. What's good? I teach an ethics class at the college, and last week one of my students who was writing a paper on abortion interviewed the director of the local Planned Parenthood um, Center in Lancaster. And this woman, in glowing terms, talked about the wonderful service that they provided by uh, aborting babies that were unwanted. See, if there's no God, you might look at abortion and say, that's a horrific evil, and another person might say, no, actually, I think it's a good, and there is no way to judge between those, we just have to accept each other's opinions, which leads to anarchy, where you call something good, I call it bad, and all that matters in the end is force and who's more powerful. Reason <coughs> is another authority people rely on. Some would say only what the mind and society deem to be reasonable is true. Now, the problem is, what happens when we disagree? And that's where we push back on that. Well, who gets to decide what's true, what's not true? Some would go to philosophy. Only what intellectuals and academic institutions hold can be true. That is, let's let the philosophers tell us the truth. Oh, please don't do that. <laughs> I took a, a year in my doctoral studies and, and studied German philosophy at Villanova University. And um, I, was, I was an old man by the time I was in my late 30s, and most of the doctoral students were in their mid-20s. And uh, so we would hang out together, and after a semester and a half, I said, uh, do you guys ever discuss truth? Because all this time in philosophy, no one had ever mentioned truth. They're like, nah, we don't care about that. I said, so why are you doing a doctorate in philosophy? And uh, they all kind of looked at this one student who was kind of their leader. He was the brightest. He's like, well, because we, we want to get really cushy jobs at a university, drink fine wine, listen to jazz music, 
And besides that, this is what he said, chicks dig philosophy professors. Okay, then this is the state of philosophy. <laughs> is, uh, it's all about getting girls. Uh, philosophy is, again, like science, it's a gift from God to explore our world, but it is never intended to be the foundation for truth. And then finally, religion. Some people believe that sincerity in your belief is all that God, however you conceive of him, requires of you. And yet we can be sincerely wrong. So what do we want to do then? In asking these questions, we want to challenge arguments against the Christian worldview. And by doing that, we demolish the strongholds in their minds. So imagine a person's belief system like a Jenga set. And what happens is they've built up their belief system and it answers every question in their life. And by asking questions, what you're going to do is you're probing, you're looking for, for things that you, know, you can ask a question about and they say, oh yeah, I guess that doesn't really make sense or that's inconsistent. And what you're doing by asking questions, you're, you're just slowly but surely whittling away at the foundation of their beliefs. And sometimes this takes place in one conversation, sometimes this takes place over months and years where you're just, you're challenging them and over time they start to notice, man, I, I thought my belief system was totally supportable, but you know, you've, you've torn it down a bit. And the more you have opportunity to do that with people, the more you start to shake them and they come to realize, wow, I, this is really problematic. I was so confident that what I believed was true, and now I'm looking, and every time I get together with this Christian, they're asking me questions. And at some point, when the Holy Spirit convicts them, they come to realize their whole worldview comes crashing down. And that's when you bring in the Christian worldview. Well, you do that all along, but to show them, here's your worldview. It's full of inconsistencies, irrationalities, mistaken notions. Here's the Christian worldview, which answers all these questions. And then they have to see them in contrast. And that's where for so many people, it's like, this is, this is a disaster. It fails. But Christ is the answer for all these things. And that's why, as I'm looking for weaknesses, I don't have to push the whole thing over because you can't do that. But just little by little, asking questions, showing concern, showing them the contrast of your life in Christ compared to a life without Christ. And over time, their philosophy, their worldview begins to crumble. So how do we do that practically as we're asking questions? We're trying to test the consistency of their worldview. I should say test, oh, test the consistency and livability. Those are the two things I'm looking for. Consistency and livability. Here's a good example. We mentioned this a little bit last night. If someone tells me, oh, I'm an evolutionist, I believe in natural selection, there's no God. I then ask them, so where do we find meaning in life? A consistent answer is there's no such thing as meaning in life. That's an illusion. But because we're made in the image of God, we all hunger for meaning. I'll also push them on, so uh, have you ever lost someone you love or felt deep grief? Why? Because if the evolutionary worldview is true and there is no God, then we're only, we're only wired for survival. And when people die, we should actually applaud because natural selection is having its way. But we don't. Again, because we cannot escape that we're made in the image of God and we feel deep down within our heart that the world is not the way it's supposed to be. But if you believe in evolutionary worldview, the world is exactly the way it's supposed to be and there's no way for you to say that's wrong or that's right because evolution, natural selection, is a blind process. There's no intentionality, there's no meaning, there's no good. And people that claim those things then are inconsistent. They're trying to sneak those ideas into their worldview. And then livability. Can we actually live this way that they say? You know, I don't even believe in reality. Okay, step out in front of that bus. We'll see if you really believe that. <laughs> Ravi Zacharias talks about that. In, even in India, where they, den they deny reality, people look both ways before they cross the street. Because you can't actually live that way. And we're trying to show them the Christian worldview is not only consistent, but it's livable. You can actually live that believing this world has glory and beauty and there's good because God made it that way, but it's also broken because human sin brought a curse on the world. And that is a much better explanation than to somehow say it came about by blind chance and yet somehow we're able to make up this idea of good. 
Secondly, we want to call his bluff. Sometimes people bluff. Well, don't you know that science has disproven God? Or don't you know that Christianity has been exposed as a fraud? Oh, really? Tell me about that. In other words, I don't have to answer back, no, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. That, as you know, that's fruitless. You tried that with your siblings when you were five years old. Just, well, tell me all about that and let them talk themselves into a circle. Here's another one. Correct his misconceptions about the Christian faith. In other words, never assume that a person who has objections to the Christian faith truly understands what the Christian faith is. Most people have no concept of the gospel if you ask them, so what do you think Christians believe? They'll say things like, well, you follow the Bible because you love lots of rules and you're a self-righteous person, you're trying to be good, trying to be better than everybody else. And that's where we have to be sure that as we're talking with unbelievers, we tell them, can I tell you what the good news of the gospel really is? The good news of the gospel is that we are far worse than we ever imagined. And God is far more loving than we ever imagined. That's the gospel. Christianity is all about acknowledging that I am a, a subject in God's world. I'm an enemy of God. But God loves me and gave his son to die on, for, on the cross for me. And it's not about being good to get to heaven. It's about admitting I'm not good and putting my faith in Jesus. That's the good news of the gospel. And I guarantee most unbelievers cannot say that back to you properly because they misunderstand. So always make sure you clarify what it is that we actually believe. Show how the Christian faith can answer any legitimate challenge leveled against it. This was a, a personal uh, search of my own. I, I, I studied philosophy. I studied, um, I took a semester at Harvard when I was working on a degree in Boston at another school, studying ancient Greek copies of the New Testament. And my professor was a world-renowned New Testament scholar, an atheist, studied the New Testament his entire life, didn't believe a word of it. All the other people in the class were all unbelievers, and I was the one Christian in there. And we actually studied some of the original Greek manuscripts. And the end of the conclusion was that the New Testament's extremely reliable. <laughs> and yet no one believed it. Uh, and, and for my own self, coming to study philosophy, uh, the history of surrounding the Christian faith, any challenge that can be leveled against the Christian faith, there are very good answers for. And sometimes I don't know the answers, but I know someone knows them. I was just at a conference in Kentucky last week, and two world-renowned Cambridge professors, Simon Gathercole and Peter Williams, are the world ex experts in several areas of the New Testament, and they're evangelical Christians. And their whole life uh, work is to study the New Testament and to show on a very micro level all the historical evidence for the New Testament. Things like the, the New Testament mentions 27 towns and villages, and they have found archaeological evidence so far for 22 of those 27. When years ago critics said none of these towns existed, we have no evidence for them, these guys are doing the lion's share of revealing and showing where archaeological literary evidence points to little things like that. So there is no argument that can be leveled against the Christian faith for which there are not good answers. And then, whenever you're dealing with an unbeliever, if you don't know, say so. Don't ever bluff and say, well, you know, don't you know that the Bible's been proven unconditionally and that 99% of the people in the world are actually Christians? And you, No. Don't bluff and make up statistics. Sometimes it's the best to say, you know, that's a great question. I have no idea how to answer that. Can I get back to you with an answer? And that shows that you're human and you're not some brainwashed person who is supposed to know everything. And then lastly, uh, whenever I'm talking with an unbeliever, eventually I want to get around to one of these two questions. Number one, epistemology, which is a big word, which means how do you know what you know? So I will keep asking people, how do you know that's true? What do you base that on? All those questions were epistemological questions. Because most people believe things that they really don't have good justification for. They'll say, well, I, I heard that somewhere or I read that, or one of my professors told me that. Well, then how do you know it's true? And you keep pushing long enough, and many people will say, well, I, I don't know, I guess I just believe it. Okay, well, then can I challenge that? Then we switch into offensive mode. But the other really helpful avenue is to talk about ethics. What is right and wrong, and what makes them right and wrong? In so many worldviews, this is the most obviously inconsistent aspect of their worldview. 
Because what they do is they sneak in Christian presuppositions or Christian assumptions underneath their worldview. For example, when you ask someone who is an atheist, skeptic, evolutionist, how they determine right and wrong, they'll, they'll sneak in Christian, Christian ideas. A good example is Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, in which he trashes God and Christianity for about 300 pages and then finishes by saying, by the way, the Ten Commandments, homophobic, misogynistic, hateful. Let me give you my own Ten Commandments. Love other people, do kindness. Like, whoa, time out. You're an evolutionist. You're, you're making that stuff up or sneaking it in because natural selection is anything but loving. I was sitting in class just last week. I teach a, a class, a small class of five students in advanced theology. And uh, we were sitting in a conference room with a big glass wall. And we were about to start class, and one of the students was like, oh, my goodness. And we're like, what? And he said, come look at this. And three crows had captured a baby bunny. And we got to see natural selection in its most brutal form as that one crow just pecking away at the bunny's brain until it died, and they're ripping its body apart. Like, that's natural selection. That's the law of the jungle. That's fighting for survival. Where do you get this idea of love and kindness and empathy? Well, you're borrowing it from Christianity, trying to sneak it in, but that's inconsistent. That's just one choice among many. So ask something like, do you believe in evil? When people say, I don't believe in uh, a God when there's so much evil and the suffering in the world. But if people say yes, my response is, if you argue, argue for evil, you must also believe in good that stands in contrast. And most people, yes, of course, there's evil things, there's good things. But good implies a moral law. There must be some way to distinguish between what's right and wrong. Otherwise, it depends on place and time. And you can't condemn Nazi atrocities or ISIS atrocities because that's a different culture or a different time. But most people will say, no, 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 wait a minute, that is, that's definitely universally wrong. Well, if there's a moral law, it didn't come about by chance. There has to be a moral law giver. A moral law must have a moral law giver. Therefore, if you believe in evil that you're bothered by, you have to assume that there's a moral law giver or your question doesn't even make sense. And for a lot of people, that's a mind-blown revelation. They're like, oh, I never thought about it like that. Another thing I often do is um, ask people, how do you decide between good and evil? And a lot of times, if you see the circle there, they'll say... Well, it's personal in the center of the circle. We each decide for ourselves what's right and wrong. Oh, okay, we each decide for ourselves. So what happens if my, my view of right and wrong conflicts with yours? I was sitting in a, in a Starbucks again, coffee shops are just fruitful places for conversations, and a guy came and sat down next to me reading a Deepak Chopra book, The New Age Guru. So whenever I'm near someone reading a book, I'll always start a conversation by saying, oh, that looks really interesting. What's that book about? He said, well, this is a book about self-fulfillment, self-actualization. I said, interesting. And, and what does he say? He says, well, we should each seek our own self-actualization, each find the fulfillment and fullness of ourselves. I said, wow, that's, that sounds interesting. What happens if what I seek conflicts with what you seek? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, what happens if I'm bigger and stronger than you and my path of self-fulfillment is aggression and cruelty and I take from you what you have? And he sensed a trap. He said, well, if you needed what I had more than I did, I, I would let you have it. I said, wow, you're a very generous person, much more generous than me. I said, but let's take it further. Let's say while we're sitting here, someone goes to your house and they clean out everything. He said, well, if they needed it more than I did, I would let them do it. I said, and let's say they stole your identity, emptied your bank accounts. And he, he realized he had to stick in with it and be consistent. I said, yep, no problem. I, I would be okay with that. I said, so you wouldn't call the police? He goes, no, of course I'd call the police. I say, why? Why would you interfere with that person's self-actualization? <laughs> In other words, he was trying, and, and by the way, we know that's not livable, that idea. I'm just, oh, you can have all my stuff. And, but he was realized he was caught in a trap. So then he says, well, society. And so they retreat one level. Society tells us right from wrong. Oh, society, Okay. So if a society says something's right, then it's okay? Yes. So what about Germany in the 1930s? What about an ISIS-controlled territory where everyone agrees on how society should work? 
He goes, well, common sense tells you that's not right. He's retreating again. Common sense will tell you that that's not a just society. He said, well, wait a second. You just said society determines. Well, common sense. Ah. But don't you know that people all around the world, different cultures, have different ideas of what's common sense? And see, the truth is you cannot ground morals and ethics in anything but the Christian God. It always contradicts itself. I said, I think what you're looking for is something transcendent, something outside of us which reveals moral truth, moral law to us. And so you're trying to avoid the topic of God, but if you don't go to a God who's revealed these things to us, then you're stuck in this endless cycle of we each decide for ourselves, society determines, it's common sense, and none of those can support the weight of right and wrong in our world. Questions. We'll take six minutes for questions and we'll break and we'll come back here and work ourselves back onto schedule.